Welcome to the series Writing for Games. In this video, I'm going to discuss planning for dialogue. So let's review what we've been talking about. We create dialogue in games for two purposes. Communication between characters, characters have a conversation, and we're also informing players. Remember, when we're writing for games, it's often like writing for the stage, writing for a play or a musical. People are having a conversation in one place, but a larger group of people, the audience, is observing that conversation and learning information about the ongoing story. So while we're writing for games, we're not only having that conversation between characters about what they're discussing and making plans, but constantly and always there's an audience, the players, who are gaining information from the ongoing conversation, the dialogue happening in front of them. We often in games have dialogue boxes. These are generally in the bottom of the screen, sometimes other places. And as well, we have strict limits. Depending on the game, the engine, and the project, these limits can be very, very different. 20 words, 30 words, 50 words, maybe even more, but generally there's a hard limit. And so we need to kind of keep the technical limitation in mind when we write dialogue for games. So across the series, I've covered four different types of dialogue. Narration, interactive, barks and grunts, and ambient. Each of these solves giving information to a player in a slightly different way. With narration, sometimes we can step outside of any particular character and give the player more direct information without it being within a certain character's perspective or knowledge. With that, though, we generally have a time perspective. We are describing past events. Here's what happened in the history of this world, or here's what previously happened that you need to be informed of player to make actions within the world. As well as when we talk about interactive, these allow a player to choose between possible dialogue options. They tend to appear most often in role-playing games and occasionally in more action-oriented games. For barks and grunts, these appear as the fastest way to convey information, but are also the shortest. Generally, a word, sometimes may up to a few words, to really convey information fast. In competitive or online games, you often find barks and grunts are the primary form of story delivery to really get information very, very quickly. And remember, of course, we often associate barks and grunts, but they are two different things. Barks are generally words and phrases. Grunts are generally voiced exclamations of pain, of pleasure, kind of heightened emotion. So generally just show some type of hurt or change in character status. And barks are generally information, reloading, or hills here, or some other information to relay that to the player. Finally, with ambient dialogue, these are often found in larger worlds, generally role-playing games, where information is delivered much more passively. So instead of starting an interaction, which we might find with interactive or possibly with narrative, or generally triggered by something in barks and grunts. This is information delivered generally on the side of the screen or in kind of dialogue boxes that might appear over character's head in a much more passive delivery, but it helps give a little more information about a town or a city or an area, sometimes story information, and it's generally not as found in kind of more indie games. Generally, other categories are found most often there, but in large, generally higher budget games, often ambient dialogue appears. So as part of this video, let's kind of discuss the questions to consider when planning dialogue. So we have four different choices, kind of five if you consider grunts its own separate choice, about how we can deliver information. Because again, we're creating dialogue, we're having a conversation between characters, but we're also, and always, informing players about things. So let's look through some questions. First, what is the best delivery method for the project? Now, I have best in quotation marks because they can depend highly on the project and the design goals of the project. If you're creating a very large budget game, you potentially have lots of time and lots of people to develop lots of writing. And so creating ambient dialogue and barks and narration and interactive might be very easy with a larger team or a much larger budget and generally more time. If you're in a much smaller team, generally a one-person or even a 20-person team, you may not be able to support all of those different types of dialogue, and you might want to choose which one fits best your project. So, as well, what te technical limits exist? So I've mentioned that generally things like interactive dialogue tend to be found on more role-playing games. More action-oriented games 
don't usually have it, and in some, depending on their game engine, the kind of technical underpinning of the project may not allow interactive dialogue at all. So you may find, if you start looking for it, that there may be kind of narration or interactive things in some projects, but they may not exist at all in others. And finally, especially as we're talking about interactive moments, what are the most interesting interactive moments? And I'll give you some questions to consider as we look at this larger question. So let's kind of walk through each of these questions in turn. So when we're considering the best delivery method for the project, I have kind of a set of questions here that tend towards one over another, but of course, multiple could be possible to use. If your story is more centered on a single person or a small group, narration might be a good option. Remember games like Final Fantasy X tends to be centered on a single person. We have their perspective. They are telling a story from past events. We also have Bastion, a very similar idea, where one person is telling a story about another person. We also have the Stanley Parable, which to great comedic effect uses the idea of narration as kind of a internal story conflict about what a player will do. Notice though that there aren't too many games that have direct narration. It tends to be maybe a dozen, maybe 20 in the last kind of 30 years that do it very well. So be very careful of narration. It can be incredibly powerful, but it's also a little tricky to write and kind of set up depending on the project. Second, does the game have an emphasis on role playing? I keep mentioning role playing games because they tend to be the ones that have the most interactive dialogue because they want to give the player the most agency that is the most availability to make choices about story presentation. In more action oriented games, or especially online competitive games, there's generally no interactive dialogue. They might be making mechanical choices, and we'll talk a little bit about what those interactions look like. But they're generally not making story choices for the most part. Does the world contain many people or contain large amounts of background information to convey? In which case, ambient dialogue might be really useful. If you're making a largely self-contained adventure game, a house and a handful of rooms, ambient dialogue you probably don't need. You might have some interactive dialogue though, and you might also have some narration. Maybe you won't have park barks and grunts. It kind of depends on the project. So notice that depending on the genre and the presentation, you might have some things over other things. And these are choices to make. How are we conveying information to the players? And again, how are characters having conversations? So let's move over to technical limitations. Because again, depending on the game engine, the framework, and all kinds of software and hardware presentation limitations, you might not be able to do more than a few words, or as it says right here, what is the maximum word count? When we're putting this together, we need to constantly think about what is the maximum word count. I've mentioned before, depending on the engine and presentation and number of the factors, the amount of words on the screen at one time might be very low. Compared, for example, Final Fantasy XIV and MMO often has multiple sentences on the screen during their interactions, whereas some of the Mass Effect games, a game that tends to be more action-oriented, generally has a couple of sentences at most, and sometimes even a handful of words during the interactive dialogue moments. So consider what software and hardware limitations might be at play. As well as do all boxes need a speaker? Generally you'll find in many games that have large amounts of dialogue, so for example the Persona series has lots and lots of dialogue, it generally has a speaker associated with it. One of the characters is saying these words even if you don't necessarily know who the character is. It might put three question marks or imply that there's a speaker. Depending on the game and again software limitations, there might be a need for a speaker or at least a name associated with things. So it might be very hard to give kind of a narration that's outside of a particular person but from a particular time perspective. This is again a conversation to have about the hardware and software limitations of the project. Also, would interactive dialogue be useful? Many role-playing games have interactive dialogue, but many action games do not. Many, many games within the larger collection of Mario games don't have interactive dialogue at all. A handful of them do, but most of them don't. It may show dialogue on the screen, may kind of show narration, or there might be a conversation, but generally there isn't a opportunity for a player to make story choices. Now they might make them mechanically, but they don't generally make them through story options and interactive dialogue. Some games have it, but generally they don't. And this is true of many, many, again, more action-oriented games where interactive dialogue simply doesn't exist at all. And in the same way, is, inter is ambient dialogue possible? 
For many games, ambient dialogue is not needed at all. In fact, only in very, very large games with large worlds that want to show a kind of active and ongoing world will ambient dialogue be particularly useful. Now, there might be some ways to deliver information, as in the Fallout 3 example, where the radio host delivers information more passively about the world that might be incredibly useful. Dialogue can be delivered in different ways, but ambient dialogue might not always be possible. So let's close this by considering the last question. What are the most interesting interactive moments? And here's where a little bit of the game design can sometimes conflict with a little bit of the story design, or as we'll talk about in a different series, the narrative design behind this. We might want to deliver information in a particular way, but it might, as writers and designers and developers, conflict with the other existing game design through its mechanics. So often we need to think about what are the most interesting interactive moments, or put it another way, what are the most interesting choices a player may make within the game? Are they making mechanical choices? That is, are they making choices about equipment, or skills, or statistics, or other things? That might be the most interesting choices that players are making within the game. If this is true, then generally the kind of main user interface might be more dedicated to these things. Think, for example, the Dark Souls series of games, or Elden Ring, where generally, most of the time, players are spending a lot of time in menus. They're choosing equipment. They're considering what they're going to buy or what they're going to sell or what they're going to pick up. They're spending a lot of time making mechanical choices that might have story implications but tend to be more mechanical. So on the same side, what story choices will players be making? Are they making character creation choices about who they're picking among a set of characters or ancestry choices? Are they more elven or dwarfish or whatever other species or races might exist within the game? And does this have effect on story content? Are they making a lot of upfront choices during story creation that will then affect later story content? Or are they making later choices about factions, who they're going to support, what side quests they're going to take on, choices among main quests that might be interesting, or again, most interesting interactive moments? Finally, what are story determinative choices? We often find, in, in even in role-playing games, that tend to have more interactive dialogue, that there are moments where a player might be given choices about whether or not to take on a side quest or not, and it might have no impact on the larger plot. And in fact, many side quests don't. But there might be situations that among a main plot or main scenario, where players ask asked to make choices that have major determinative outcomes. That is, they may be asked to support one faction over another faction, that may majorly change a world, in which case these are probably the most interesting choices. That is, a player is rarely asked, and this is something to think about for many writers going into this, about whether or not they will invest in, say, a lunch or not. That may have mechanical bonuses, depending on what you eat in certain games, monster world games, for example, depending on your meals, you might get certain bonuses. They rarely have story-determinative outcomes. That is, what you eat generally is not super interesting for the story. At the same time, making choices among to support or kill a king might have major implications. And so as writers and designers, we generally need to think about what are the kind of most interesting choices for someone to make. Again, think about what they want to do that might affect the world or might affect a play that a player would really enjoy making. So as we're considering all of these, we need to think about the corresponding questions. What is the best delivery method? Again, we're always conveying information to a player, so what's the best way to do it? Are we making a more action-oriented game, a more slower game that might be more role-playing in nature, or a simulation, or strategy game, in which maybe narration and interactive dialogue might be more appropriate? Or is it faster and more action-oriented with barks and grunts? Might be a better way to convey information. What tactical limits is this? How many words can we put on the screen? Can we put in three sentences, four sentences, five sentences, multiple paragraphs? Or are we limited to 10 words, 12 words? That will really affect how many kind of dialogue boxes appear within the screen. Are we going to have people sit through 10 minutes of dialogue boxes or four or five screens of it? And this is ways to think about how we design these things. And then finally, what are the most interesting interactive moments? We want to give players a reason to stick around in the game or a reason to build up to a certain moment in the game. 
So we want them making interesting choices they can engage the story with. So what are interesting story determinative choices? Are we supporting a king or killing a king? So having said all this, when we're first planning this dialogue, lots of questions to ask about their project. Now, sometimes in consideration of these questions, a writer might come in towards the end of a project where lots of, all, lots of these things have already been decided, in which case the writer just needs to fill in what their job is and kind of work the best with what already exists. In some cases, the writer is the main developer, so there's lots of room to make lots of choices about how information is going to be conveyed. And there's also lots of things in between. There may be cases where a writer joins a project or a writer has a little more time to kind of influence different mechanical versus story outcomes. In which case, these questions are good to kind of orient people, especially new writers, about how we plan dialogue for games, questions we ask, the considerations we take under to really understand how best we can match the types of dialogue we might use, when they are most appropriate, and again, thinking about the project and its goals, well, how are we trying to convey, what is the project, what is the kind of narrative or design goals, keeping all of these as part of the considerations as we plan dialogue for games. Thanks for watching.